um, we were uh, learning about um, the definitions of the um, uh, the Tosefta, the Mishnah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I thought after we, I hung up. So where does the half Torah readings come from? Great question. Let's hold that until we actually okay. begin the class in about a minute. And I'm happy okay. to answer that question as well. Thank you. So I'm going to call on you as we begin to ask your question. Okay. All right. I'm watching the clock until we go live at noon mm -hmm. before we get started. Ah, thank you, David. I got it. There was there was an extra E in oh. in what you had sent me. Okay. So I will definitely reply to you. Uh, I'll send you the message. Good, good afternoon, everyone. It is now 12 o'clock. We are live around the world. It's great to see everyone. Thank you for joining us the second week uh, as we continue our conversation about Honi and the Circle Maker. Um, and before we jump into our learning for the day, as folks are still making their way into the room, Phyllis, I understand you had a follow-up question yes. from last week. So Phyllis, the floor is yours to ask your question. Wonderful. Be quiet, huh? <laughs> okay, I was uh, really enjoying last week so much. I had um, learned about the Mishnah, which I really didn't know what in Jewish uh, material that was, and the Gomorrah and the Talmud and the Tosefta. And then as I was hanging up, I realized where does the Haftorah come in? You know, which works make up the Haftorah? That's a great question. So okay. uh, your the the time frame that we're talking about of the Mishnah and the Tosefta and the Talmud and the Gemara, which make up the Talmud, is in the earlier part of, of the rabbinic period. So we're talking about zeros, one hundreds, two hundreds, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundreds of the common era. That is the beginning of the rabbinic period. And that's when those texts come from. The, the texts that make up the Haftarot are from the books of the prophets. Uh -huh. Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the 12 yes. minor prophets, prophets like Micha and Joel and Ovadia and Amos and Nahum and Habakkuk. And I don't remember all the rest of them. There's 12 and, yes. and often on the test, you just ask who are the 12. So the custom of reading the prophets as part of the service came about as a result of the Hanukkah story, right? Because King Antiochus, among the various things that he did to the Jews, is he outlawed the reading of Torah in public because public reading of Torah of any scriptural text is an educational method. And Antiochus was trying to outlaw Judaism from the community. And if you told the Jews they can't read from the Torah in public, especially in an era where most people or many people were not literates, a public reading or ending public readings was a way to end the chain of transmission from one generation to the next. So Antiochus says you cannot read from the Torah in public. If you do so, you're subject to capital punishment. Our leaders of the time are sages. And for those of you just joining in the room, this is an aside, a question that was asked from last week, where did the Haftarah come from? So the sages of the time of King Antiochus said, ah, ha, ha, ha. we cannot read from the Torah. But King Antiochus didn't say anything about reading from the prophets or anything about reading from the writings. And so the sages looked at each Torah portion and identified some theme or some area of content or some message from that Torah portion and found a selection from the books of the prophets that was similar. And during the reign of King Antiochus, we would read from the books of the prophets, those readings in lieu of the Torah portion, one for each Torah portion, one for each holiday, all the times we might read from Torah as a public ritual. Then after the fall, after the, the Maccabean revolt and King Antiochus's deposition, deposing from being king, we got to go back to reading from Torah. And the sages said, ah, ha, 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 but this stuff from prophets, it's really good. So what we'll do is we'll read the Torah portion, because of course we're going to read the Torah portion first. And then as a way to conclude the reading section of the service, we'll read that selection from the prophets and we'll call it the conclusion reading. And the word for conclusion in Hebrew is haftarah. Lahaftir is to conclude. 
So that is why it is called a Haftarah. It's the conclusion reading of the service. But to answer your question in terms of a time frame, the texts of the books of the prophets go all the way back to, well, the book of Joshua begins after the end of the Torah. When Moses dies, we're talking about in the later parts of the second millennium before the common era, 1200s, 1100s, 1000s BCE, taking us all the way down to the destruction of the temple in 586 BCE. And some of the books of the prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah were clearly reflecting on the exile period after the destruction. So even into the 500s BCE. So we're talking about anywhere from 700 to 1000 years before we get to the rabbinic period of the Mishnah and the Tosefta and the Talmud. That is a long answer to a short, but a no, very thank you. question. Thank you. Right. But it gives us a sense of the evolution of this, right? We were reading from the biblical texts, Torah, prophets, writings, for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries. And they were our only guiding text, really until the destruction of the second temple, in the year 70. And when the second temple was destroyed in the year 70, that's when the big question of how do we have a Judaism that doesn't require ritual animal sacrifice in the temple in Jerusalem? How do we have that? What might that look like? And that was the question that the rabbi sought to answer with first with the Mishnah. And then and at the same time, the Tosefta were sort of minority opinions, other thoughts, other ideas that didn't get codified into the Mishnah, but remained in existence on paper. And then as the second wave of rabbis, obviously not second generation, because we're talking about many, many, many centuries between the Mishnah and the Gemara, but as the second wave of rabbis in the five and 600, 700s began to reflect on the Mishnah and to say, well, my reading this sentence from the Mishnah makes me wonder about this. And they began to answer those questions that's where many of those texts that were in the Tosefta were brought back into the conversation. And the rabbi said, oh, there's an answer to this question that was in a, a section from the, from the Tosefta. And when in the Gemara, and we'll see this in the next few weeks, when the Gemara refers to what's called a baraita, B-A-R-A-I-T-A, -A what they're really saying is, here is a teaching that comes from the Tosefta that wasn't in the Mishnah of, this, of the same time, but we're going to reinsert it into the dialogue as a proof text for whatever points I'm going to make. When we see Barai Tote in our learning over the next few weeks, I'll be sure to remind us of that as well. All uh, right. I, may I ask you, I tried, I missed last week. So when I went on the Shure Cloud, it's not there. It's like I have to wait till the very end for the whole series to be on there. I have no answer to that question. I can find out later today. But Thank I'm going to do a quick review today for your benefit, Margaret. Don't worry. All right. So I'm going to invite, I'm going to put everyone on mute. P please feel free to interrupt with questions, raise your hand, wave your arms, unmute yourself, such as it is. All right, here we go. So we are talking about Honey the Circle Maker. And as I mentioned last week, that much of what we're going to learn today was, was put together by Rabbi Dr. Aaron Pink in a blessed memory in a paper that he wrote, Telling Retellings. Honey the Circle Maker and the Development of Rabbinic Narrative Discourse um, from a book called From Scrolls to Traditions that was published last year, obviously posthumous to Rabbi Pankin's uh, tragic passing uh, a few years ago, uh, but he had, already, he had already written it. Um, the translations are from sfaria.org, unless uh, we point out otherwise. Um, and just a reminder, the big question that we're going to explore over this, over this month by looking at the various iterations of the story of Choni the circle maker, is the question of what is Choni or who is Choni? Is he a martyr, as we saw in the story of Josephus? Is he a prophet who can tell God's words? Is he a magician or a miracle worker who is, has independent power from the Holy One, who makes things happen on his own? Is he simply a righteous man who prays to God? Is he a charismatic holy man? which is probably somewhere in between magician, miracle worker, and pious man. Is he a devout man who simply prayed? Is he a rabbi? And how might that be answered as we get to that as well? Some of the things to think about as we're going forward. Okay. 
a quick a quick refresher or reintroduction for those of you who are new. The story of Choni and the Circle Maker, the the quote unquote authoritative, the one the one that most Jews are familiar with, comes to us from from the Babylonian Talmud in this section called Ta'anit, which is the section about fasts. The I use the word section, but I should use the better language. The the name for a particular topical section of the Talmud in English is called a tractate. In Hebrew, it's called a masechet. And so it comes from a sechet ta'anit, the section, the tractate about fasts and public fasts. Because when there was a dearth of rain, it might be a cause for a public fast. And that's where it gets, that's where it ends up in, in the Babylonian Talmud. But the story doesn't begin there. As we saw last week, and we're going to review today, there was a series of a development of the story going all the way back to Josephus. Josephus, who was a historian, at least what would pass for a historian, if there are any students of history on the call, anyone who studied history or teaches history know that what that history has a way of doing things, of research and a background, and Josephus wasn't that. He was probably more like uh, a page six reporter of his time, telling the stories and framing them in a way to advance the narrative that he wanted to have advanced. So Josephus was writing as the, you know, around the time of the life of Jesus of Nazareth, right? The last few centuries of the Roman rule over Jerusalem, the last few centuries and of the standing of the temple in Jerusalem. He was Jewish, and then he switched sides and joined the Roman side when he had been captured by the Romans. And so his perspective of stories was there. But Josephus is really, really, really important to our understanding of the development of the Jewish tradition. If you've ever heard of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes, it's from Josephus. He was the one who recorded that during this time period, there were these various sects of Judaism. And we believe, for example, that the Sadducees were the ones committed to the temple ritual. And the Pharisees were the earliest form of the rabbi, the sort of proto-rabbis, who were passing on the oral tradition that became the Mishnah and the Gemara. That the Essenes probably were, and of course, this was not known to history for many, 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 many centuries, between the time of Josephus and 1948, that the Essenes were probably the Qumran sect that were the authors of the Dead Sea, or the editors, I should say, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There, of course, was another sect at the same time, the Jewish Christians, the followers of Jesus of Nazareth who broke off and in, in to become Christianity, but they all came from the same time period as Josephus recorded. He recorded the stories of King Antiochus, right, and the Maccabean revolts. He recorded stories of a variety of things, and he told us, we'll see in a moment, the story of, of Onias, who was asked by the Jewish people to pray for rain when there was no rain. And that may have been the first iteration of the story of Honey the Circle Maker. Certainly, my presentation today would argue such. Fast forward a few centuries, we have a story of Choni from the Tosefta and a story of Choni from the Mishnah. We generally date these, these collection of texts to around the year 200 of the Common Era. But as we learned last week, the suggestion is that the story of Choni the Circle Maker as presented in the Tosefta predates the story of Choni the Circle Maker as presented in the Mishnah because of the textual, just the way the texts were written, that the Tosefta is very short, the Mishnah has a lot more to it. The suggestion is that there was an iteration from one to the next, and the Mishnah was later, even though they were of similar time period. We have an iteration that we'll look at next week from the Jerusalem Talmud, the Talmud that was a little bit earlier than the Babylonian that came to us from the land of Israel, and then the one that comes to us from the Babylonian Talmud, which becomes the story that we know, the story that if you watch, for example, we watched a video last week put together by Bim Bomb. It's like a four minute video about the story of Coney the Circle Maker. That's, excuse me, that's the story that we know. So real quick, I'm gonna read these real fast, real fast, a review of our textual history, the story from Josephus. Now there was one whose name was Onias, and you can hear Choni and Onias, right? The O, the N, the I, the A, S because it becomes Greek. Same guy. A righteous man that he was and a beloved of God. 
who in a certain drought had prayed to God to put an end to the intense heat and whose prayers God had heard and sent them rain. This man had hid himself because he saw that this sedition would last a great while. However, they brought him to the Jewish camp as desired that as by his prayers, he had once put an end to the drought. So he would in like manner make imprecations on Aristobulus and those of his faction, right? They're bringing him this man who can pray to God and change the outcomes to now have an effect on the outcome of the internal politics of the time. And when upon his refusal and the excuses that he made, he was still by the multitude compelled to speak. He stood up in the midst of them and said, O God, King of the whole world, since those that stand now with me are by people and those who are besieged are thy priests, I beseech thee thou wilt neither hearken to the prayers of those against these nor bring to effect what these pray against those. Right? He's trying to sort of stand in between and say, ah, God, don't hurt anybody. Whereupon such wicked Jews as stood out about him and stood as he made the prayer and stoned him to death, martyred for his belief. But God punished them immediately for their barbarity and took vengeance of them for the murder of Onias in the manner following. When the priests and Aristobulus were besieged, it had happened at the feast called the Passover was come, putting this whole incident at the end of the rainy season. Passover marks the end of the rainy season. And if you are praying for rain at the end of the rainy season, what you're saying is it hasn't rained all season. And we have six, at least six months of dry coming in the future. That will be a calamity for the community. It is, of course, in the Passover season, our custom to offer a great number of sacrifices to God. But those that were with Aristobulus wanted sacrifices and desired that their countrymen would without would furnish them such sacrifices and assured them they would have as much money for them as they should desire when they required him to pay a thousand drachmae for each head of cattle. Aristobulus and the priests willingly undertook to pay for them accordingly. And those within let down the money over the walls and gave it to them. But when the others had received it, they did not deliver the sacrifices. And then the priests found they had been cheated. They prayed to God that he would avenge them on their countrymen. Nor did he delay that their punishment but sent a strong and vehement storm that destroyed the fruits of the whole country. Till a modius of wheat was then bought for 11 drops. So what do we have here? A righteous man, a beloved of God, who prayed for rain during a drought, nearing Passover. God sent rain and ultimately sent even more rain than the people could handle. Right, destroying the fields towards the end of it. Now, obviously, the squabbling that took place among the political leadership, the murder of Honi, the fighting between the sacrifices was the cause of some of this. We'll see that the way in which these plot points are ordered and what causes X, Y, or Z to happen is very, very, very different in the rabbinic tradition than in the Josephus account. But the plot points are there, and there are similarities between them. And I want to just put those in our minds as we move forward. Here we was, here's where we ended last week with the first rabbinic, at least first if we trust the notion that the version in Tosefta predated the version in the Mishnah. This first story that says, a story of one Hasid, a righteous person, that they said to him, pray and rains will fall. He prayed and rains fell. They said to him, just as you have prayed and rains fell, so pray and they will go. You turned on the spigot. Now, if you would please turn off the spigot. He said to them, go out and see if a person can stand on the Karen Ophel and rinse off his foot in the Kidron River. As a reminder, what he's saying is, please go up onto a high point and have so much rain fall, fallen that have filled not only the river, but began to fill the valley around the river below the high point, right? It would be like saying, please go to the edge of the Grand Canyon and see if enough rain has filled the Colorado River to fill the entire Grand Canyon. And if so, I'd like to know that, please. We pray that rains will not fall, but sure that God is not bringing a flood ever again, as it says, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth, right? They're beginning to be fearful that too much rain has fallen and damage could come from this, like what happened in the story of Noah. 
And it says, it continues, for this is to me like the waters of Noah. As I swore the waters of Noah never more would flood the earth, so I swear I will not be angry with you or rebuke you. We see this in Isaiah. So what we're seeing here is the beginnings of the contours of the Jewish story. A man who has a deep religious, righteous relationship with the Holy One, who uses the power of prayer to bring on the rains and to turn off the rains. And who is aware of the Jewish people's history with rain and flooding and the power of too much rain, the history that begins with the story of Noah and the floods. And the promise that God said, I will never again use the power of rain to flood the whole earth and to destroy everybody. This is where we ended last week. So, Margaret, there's your quick, there's your quick refresher. Any questions before we begin to compare First Josepta and Josephus? So to do a little bit of a compare and contrast between the two, there are some important similarities and some important differences. The similarities, the praying for rain, the response that there was rain that is caused to fall, right? Which, by the way, we should note, if any one of us went outside and prayed that there would be rain, what likely, how likely would it be that rain would come and happen? I mean, listen, if you knew to check your weather app and knew that the rain was coming, you could pull the wool over eyes of people. But otherwise, we don't generally believe that individually we can pray for rain and the meteorological realities will change, which is exactly what they were asking him to do, right? Praying for rain, not only praying for rain, but praying for rain at least at certain times in, an, in a season where rain needed to come. And what happened was there was so much rain that that became problematic as well, that they had to ask that the rains be turned off. However, also some important differences. We see the name used in Josephus, but in the Tosepta, he's not referred to by name, just as some guy who was a Hasid, but he's not named. Nor is there in the Tosefta the seasonal element of it. We don't see in the text that it was a time of the year when they were expecting rain, needing rain, right? It would be one thing if he did this in the middle of the summer, that would be in fact more miraculous. It would be something else if they got it would if it was the middle of Cheshvan, and yeah, it's been a few weeks since Simchat Torah. It's the rains is supposed to start it, but it hasn't started yet. All right, we're getting a little curious. Why hasn't it rained? But if we're already at the season where, where Passover is coming and it hasn't rained all winter and we're moving into the season where it's supposed to stop raining, that would be deeply concerning. We just don't see that in the Tosefta text. It's not there like it is in Josephus. And spoiler alert, not there like it will be added back in as well. And in Tosefta, we get this mention of this place, Ophel, right, which is this interesting metaphor of the place where the, you know, where they go up high and see if the water below. However, Ophel has, is the beginning of a lot of, of rabbinic wordplay that we see throughout this. We'll see in the next version as well that there are certain places where people might go there for certain reasons, right? So for example, you might be familiar with what's called the Ir Miklat, the sanctuary city, where someone who had committed man manslaughter could take refuge from the, the blood guilt of that manslaughter. And it was known as a way to break the cycle of violence, that if you had a member of your family who was killed by, by an act of manslaughter, you were not allowed to go to the sanctuary city to take your vengeance on the person who committed that act. So this place, Ophel, is a place where people would go when they can't pay their debts. 
just put that in the back of your mind, right? It was a place that you would go when you couldn't pay your debt. Now, what's interesting also about the Tosefta version is the reference to Choni. So they call him a chassid, right? A man who is righteous, maybe a man of special sanctity, of altruism, of holiness, which is often what that name refers to. And, however, from a literary critique perspective, that they remove his name and leave him unnamed is also an act of disempowering him. You only describe him as a chassid, you make him only as a good person. And I say that because in the other versions, he's left with his name, and we see good elements of him and bad elements of him, right? Or I should say, we see holy and altruistic elements of him and perhaps human elements of him. He has a personality. He has desires. He has an ego. In the Tosefta text, we're not privy to any of that. He's just a chassid. Which also might suggest that in the telling of the Tosefta story, who is the only one ultimately responsible for what happens? If a chassid goes and prays and the prayers are answered, who is responsible for what happens? God. Thank you, Margaret. Exactly. It's entirely God's doing. And there seems to be this notion that the chassid is only the conduit, only doing God's bidding, only there to bring God's will into place, and not someone who can lean upon God, not someone who can have an effect on God's will, but just as a way to cause God's will to come into being. Obviously, if there was this story as given to us in the Tosefta, and there was a story of a chassid, and they said to him, pray, and rains would fall. And he prayed, and rains didn't fall. Probably wouldn't have the story in the Tosefta in the first place. Because that's not an interesting story. Everybody else was doing it. But for whatever reason, in this story, the chassid is the guy who can bring God's will to the fore in ways that nobody else could. Now, I'm going to share with you as we move forward that you might get a little bit of whiplash between the Tosefta story and the Mishnah story. The Tosefta story was short, just, you know, a couple, maybe, maybe 200 words, maybe. The story in Josephus significantly longer, although the story of Honey only about half of this. Why? Because he was dead by the third act. They had murdered him. And we see that the death of Honey is taken out of the story in the rabbinic tradition. He is there to see it all the way to the end, from the turning out of the reins to the turning off of the reins. And the whole idea of the intrapolitical tension in the community that we see in the Josephus story that does not survive into the rabbinic tradition. I'll ask you why at the end of the conversation today. Here we go. The story of Choni, the circle maker, when he gets the title Choni, the circle maker. maker. This is from Mishnah Ta'anit, right? We're in the same section all the way through. Ta'anit in Tosefta, Ta'anit in the Mishnah, it'll be Ta'anit in the Talmuds as well. Masechet Ta'anit, the section about public fasting. So the Mishnah is telling a story, it adds, in general, they cry out on account of any trouble that should not befall a community. Meaning a euphemism for when there is trouble that may befall the community, except for an overabundance of rain. Although too much rain may be disastrous, one does not cry out over it because rain is a sign of blessings. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the whole text in its entirety, and then we're going to go back and take it apart bit by bit because there's so much in here 
but it's hard to know why things are important until you see the whole picture. So a Mishnah relates, an incident occurred in which the people said to, Choni Hame'agel, Choni the circle maker, pray that rain should fall. He said to them, go and bring in the clay ovens used to roast the Paschal lambs so that they do not dissolve in the water as torrential rains are certain to fall. He prayed and no rain fell at all. What did he do? He drew a circle around the ground and stood inside it and said before God, Me bono shall oilam, master of the universe. Your children have turned their faces towards me as I am like a member of your household. Therefore, I take an oath by your great name that I will not move from here until you have mercy upon your children and answer their prayers for rain. Rain began to trickle down, but only in small droplets. He said, I did not ask for this, but asked for rain to fill the cisterns, ditches, and caves with enough water to last the entire year. Rain began to fall furiously. He said, I did not ask for this damaging rain either, but for rain of benevolence, blessing, and generosity. Subsequently, the rains fell in their standard manner, but continued unabated, filling the city with water until all of the Jews exited the residential areas of Jerusalem and went to the Temple Mount due to the rain. He came and said to him, excuse me, they came and said to him, just as you prayed over the rains that they should fall, so too pray that they should stop. He said to them, go out and see if the claimant's stone a large stone located in the city upon which proclamations would be posted with regard to lost and found articles had been washed away. In other words, if the water had not obliterated the claimant stone, it is not yet appropriate for the rains to cease. Shimon ben Shetach, the Nasi of the Sanhedrin, chief rabbi of the community, at the time said, relate to Choni HaMehegel, were you not Choni, I would have decreed that you be ostracized. But what can I do to you? You nag, mitchate, God, and he, God, does your bidding. Like a son who nags his father and his father does his bidding without reprimand. After all, the rain fell as you requested. About you, the verse states, let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. And that is the first iteration of the story of Choni the circle maker. We had a story of Onias, whom caused rain. We had a story of a chassid who made it rain. But this is where he gets the name Choni the circle maker. All right. What questions does the story raise? Either for you and your understanding, or you think it raises for us to consider. Oh, keep going. So here we are back to the beginning of the story. The Mishnah says, in general, they cry out of any trouble that should not befall the community, except for an overabundance of rain. So first things first, this cry out in, in the Hebrew is the same word as the word tekiah. If I say the word tekiah, what does it make you think about? So far. So far, right, Steve, right? What's the connection? Well, blowing the shofar is not limited only to the high holy days, at least in the biblical period. It was used to make announcements. It was used to bring the people together. And if there was some kind of calamity or potential calamity that would was befalling the people, there would be a lot of reasons they might have to blow the shofar to get everyone's attention to gather them for the announcement that we're going to have a public fast or whatever it might be. And we have this interesting thing. What might befall the community? Could be a war, could be a fire, could be a famine, could be a whatever. Anything that we should say, ah, we need to, we need to try to have a way to bring this to an end. 
what's the one potential calamity that they wouldn't be worried about so much they want to stop? It says it in the text. Too much rain. Too much rain. As they would say, there is no such thing as too much rain. There is no such thing as too much rain. Even if there is too much rain, we will deal with it. We'll fill the cisterns. Yes, there may be some damage, some flooding. There might even be loss of life. But we are not, in general, going to complain that there is too much rain. Why not? Because Bobby. it's a Go ahead, Bobby. Because it's a blessing. I think yes, because it's a blessing. Because it's without blessing. rain, you can't get food. You have food. Yeah. Live. Yeah. I think his rain is an inherent good. And I think also they're they're frankly worried that if we ask God to turn off the rains, it might never come back on again. And you'd be foolish if you live in an arid in an arid climate where rains only happen in limited months and you relied on it for the year, you'd be foolish to say, uh, that's enough, please, no, thank you, I'm full. And so they would never, in general, ask that the rains come to an end. That would be foolish of them. All right. It is a sign of blessing, as Bobby said. So here they are. We are now beginning the story. Here is a ma'aseh, a story which the people said to this guy, Choni HaMe'agel, Pray that rain should fall. How do we know when this story took place in the year? Bobby, go ahead. Well, it's before there was a pilgrimage to the temple. And how do we know that? Because the clay ovens used to roast the Paschal lamb, so it was before Passover. It's Paschal time, exactly. We have the they're out there roasting the Paschal lamb, right? And obviously, those clay ovens. If there was too much rain, what happens to a clay oven? No more clay oven, right? But what else does teach us also about when this story takes place in Jewish history? Not when it was codified, but when it took place. Lorraine. The Maccabee War. Or Howard. Say it again. Maccabee War. During the, the uprising. The Maccabee. What makes you say that? It, something was mentioned in there, and there was, it sounded like that's what they were talking about and worried about. Mm, I, I don't have the same concern. Okay. Um, and I will say that that's not that's not the answer I was looking for. Good. <laughs> right. So, how many of you have ever roasted a Paschal lamb? <laughs> Passover. <laughs> no, that's when a roast. That's you're right, Howard. That's when a Paschal lamb would be roasted. But I'm asking you all individually in your own lives, in your own existence, as observant Jews. How many of you have ever roasted a Paschal lamb? None. 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 Because when did the ritual of the roasting of the Paschal lamb come to an end? When the temple was destroyed. When the temple was destroyed, Judy Kernitsky for $600. Thank you very much. <laughs> the temple, when the temple stood, is when the custom was for folks to offer the roasting of the Paschal lamb. What do we do instead? We pray. We pray. But what do we do, you know, for the Paschal lamb? What do we do? We eat it. No, we, we don't. We don't eat it. We talk we about it. Have, we have Seder, Seder and we read about it and we the talk stems. about it. And we have the little, we just have the one little bone. Oh, but the man. idea of everyone roasting their Paschal lamb, making that offering of sacrifice to God for our freedom. That custom ended with the rabbinic period. So a little bit of general knowledge about the interesting piece of the Mishnah and how it's different from what came before and different what came after. The Mishnah, written around, you know, codified around the year 200, written in those first few centuries after the destruction of the temple, the Mishnah spent a lot of time 
describing the laws of the animal sacrifices in the temple. You think Leviticus talked about it? Wait till you read certain sectot of the Mishnah, where they go through in great detail describing what was to be done. Now, there's a lot of reasons why they would have done that. One is trying to make sure that we don't lose that memory, that knowledge to history. And two, because in the Mishnaic period, it wasn't inconceivable that in the near future, the temple would have been rebuilt and we would have returned to these sacrifices, rituals, just like we did between the destruction of the first temple and the building of the second temple. And so the Mishnah has in its various masechtot, the laws of what was done in the temple, the laws of agriculture in the land of Israel, because it wasn't, it hadn't given up on the idea that that society would be reestablished as it had been reestablished in the early 500s, excuse me, in the late 500s BCE and the beginning of the second temple. By the time we get 300, 400 years later to the time of the Gemara and the codification of the Babylonian Talmud, Talmud it's clear that we are now 600 years since the destruction of the temple. We're not going back to that period anytime soon. It has now been nearly 2,000 years. We have not yet rebuilt the temple. We even have reestablished a Jewish community in the land of Israel. But we're not rebuilding the temple. So what's interesting about the Mishnah is that it situates itself in a time period, in a worldview, in a milieu, a Weltanschauung, if you want to do it in German, of when people were doing the Paschal rituals, which we're not doing anymore. We have the Seder instead. But we can tell because they were, pre pre they were preparing the Paschal lambs that it was at the time period in our calendar approaching Passover when it was about to stop raining. Now, one last bit about the beginning of the story. How did the Tosefta describe our hero in the story? What was the definition or the description of him? He was a chassid, a righteous man. Choni is not described in this way. In fact, the Me'agel, there's a, a hinting of a little bit of petulance in this story. He makes people go round and round. Very, very, very different type of person in the mind of the Mishnah than in the mind of the Tosef. What did he do? He drew a circle on the ground and stood inside it and said before God, Ribono shall oilum, master of the universe, your children shall have turned their faces towards me as I am like a member of your household. God, I am part of your court and everyone here knows it. So they're looking to me. Therefore, I'm swearing an oath by your great name that I will not move from this spot until you have mercy upon your children and answer their prayers for rain. He's a chutzpah. What a chutzpah on the guy. To grandstand before God, to draw a circle around himself and say, God, the people know that you will do my bidding. The people know that I am like a member of your household. And they have asked me to tell you, to tell you to make it rain. He's the boss. <laughs> He's the boss. So he says. Now, this whole idea of drawing circles is really, really interesting. There are some biblical roots to this in the story uh, of Elijah and King Ahab in the 18th chapter of First Kings. Elijah does a similar thing. There's a fight between the Israelites and their neighbors about whose sacrifices are going to be accepted. And it ends with a pouring of rain to put out the fire. But Elijah draws, digs a ditch around almost like a circle. But drawing a circle is almost like a way to capture or encapsulate someone. It also shows dominance, right? I've got you. It's almost like a lasso, right? When you circle someone up, they got nowhere to go. 
So ordinarily, if you were trying to capture someone and make them do your bidding, what would you want to do? Yes, you sir. would make a circle around them. Exactly. So who should cir- who who should Honey have circled to make this happen? Bobby. Should have shed, he should have gone to the alt uh, to the temple or something. It has to be with God. He has put himself as if he has power himself. It's very wow. so he's taking power for sure. Uh, Laney, go ahead. He should have encircled his whole community. So if he didn't circle, that's a pretty big. That's a pretty big circle. Is he trying to capture the community? No. If, no. if he. I thought you had said if he, um, if it's raining, who should he have put the circle around? Well, it's not raining yet. Uh-huh. He's trying to make it rain. And he does this really interesting thing where he draws a, a circle around himself. But what I'm suggesting is that the act of circle drawing was an act of dominance, yeah. right? In a different context, if you were trying to fight a battle, one way to win the battle would be to encircle your opponent with all of your troops. If you got them circled and surrounded, they're toast. Bobby, who's he trying to get? Well, I think he's trying to get God. I think he's yeah. trying to get God's impression and get him with a, like a lasso and make him do what he wants. He's trying to lasso God and encircle God to make God do what Honey wants. But of course, you can't circle God because God is all around us. So instead, he does this brilliant thing and he turns the idea in on itself. And he says, rather than try to encircle God, I'm going to encircle myself. And say to God, I have encircled you by encircling myself. And I will not move from this spot. I'm standing in one spot, by the way, if you can tell. I will not move from this spot until you do what I like. And so in a figurative sense, in a literary sense, he draws the circle around God by drawing the circle around himself. I'm going to show you a story. Okay. This is an episode from the Midrash called Avoti Rabbi Natan. It comes a little bit later than the Mishnah. And it's the story of Moses and Aaron and their sister Miriam. At the time, Aaron said to Moses, Moses, my brother, you think that this, this, is, this is after Miriam, Miriam got afflicted with Sarat for cast, casting aspersion on Moses' wife. You think that the skin disease affects only Miriam, but it also affects the flesh of our father Amram. I will give you a parable to tell this parable to tell you what it's like. Like someone who has a hot coal placed in his hand. Even if he tosses it around from place to place, his flesh is still burned, right? You go back and forth, you're still going to burn your hands. The idea here is that Amram and Miriam, father and daughter, are of one flesh. And therefore, even if Miriam is afflicted, so is the other. This is why it says in Numbers 12, 12, please do not let her be like one who is dead when she emerges from her mother's womb, half of her flesh eaten away. Meanwhile, Aaron attempted to pacify Moses by saying, Moses, my brother, have we ever done harm to anyone in the world? He replied, no. Aaron continued, so what if we have done no harm to anyone in the world? Would we have wished harm upon you, you who are our brother? Now what can I do? Will this mistake become between the covenant of between us? This is Aaron speaking to Moses. For God had established a a covenant with Aaron and his sons. As it says in Amos They did not remember the covenant of brotherhood that moment when they didn't remember. So Aaron is freaking out because Miriam is very, very, very sick. And he's calling upon Moses to do something. At that moment, Moses drew a circle on the ground and stood inside it and asked for mercy for Miriam. He said, I will not leave this spot until my sister Miriam is healed. As it says in Numbers 12, 13, El na rafana la, please God, heal her. Then the Holy One said to Moses, if a king had reprimanded her, or if her father had reprimanded her, it would have been appropriate for her to sit in shame for seven days. And since it is I, Melech Malchei Hamlachim, the king of king of kings, all the more so it is just for her to sit in shame for 14 days. However, for your sake, Moses, As it says, the eternal said to Moses, if her father spat in her face, would she not sit in shame for seven days? God will heal her. In another story, in Deuteronomy Rabbah, 
when Moses is contemplating his not being allowed to cross the Jordan and enter the land of Israel, he also draws a circle around himself. Now, what's interesting is two things. First of all, Deuteronomy Rabbah and Avoti Rabbanatan come later, historically. And so clearly they're informed by the author, by the story of Honey the Circle Maker, in this really empowerful way for someone who has the power to call upon God to make something happen. But what's interesting also is in the story of Honey and in the story of Moses and Miriam, the circle making is effective and the outcome they want comes to be. However, just as a side note, does Moses ever cross the Jordan? No. No. So we have a question in the chat. Could it be seen as a miniature parallel or a reversal of God's creation by apparently withdrawing to a vacated space, a circle, could appear to exist to allow other things to be there? So maybe Choni is kind of separating out of an area of non-rain from an area of rain. So it's a really interesting question. And I think that you're onto something, Julian, but maybe not exactly what you're suggesting. Because the rains end up, you know, it's it doesn't only rain in one spot. The rains don't only fall in the circle. They rain everywhere. But there's certainly a notion that the drawing of the circle creates a notion of insiders and outsiders, who's on my team, who's on the other team, right? And, and as Honey stands in the circle, he's standing in that circle that creates separation from God, but he's standing, I think, on behalf of the Jewish people to say, are you on the inside? Are you on the outside? Let's keep that in mind as we make our way, as we make our way through the text. So, the rains fall. Margaret, go ahead. So is this thing about drawing the circle? I, I see I never remember that in any stories. So you're saying this could is part of the culture that this was done, that type of thing about drawing the circle? So what I'm suggesting is two things. That this it's it's an uncommon thing. It doesn't happen often. It doesn't happen often. That the story of Honey drawing the circle as relayed to us in the Mishnah, which then survives into the Talmud, that the idea of drawing the circle also gets drawn upon by later rabbinic sources as well. Avoti Rabbi Natan and Deuteronomy Rabbah are later Midrashim, certainly later than the Mishnah, where Moses becomes the one who draws a circle to get his way from God. And I brought that into the conversation to say, look how interesting that is. That a tactic used by Honi was, was used by Moses in the, in the Mishnah, in the Midrash. Of course, when did Honi live compared to when Moses lived? Who lived first? Moses. Moses Mo lived like, like a thousand years plus right. earlier. And so I'm also showing this sort of the time shifting that happens in the in 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 the rabbinic tradition, right? That the rabbis introduce these midrashim, these stories that are in addition to the biblical text, to give them greater context and gr give them greater understanding. But they introduce them in their own time period, so you have a story introduced after the Mishnah about events that took place before the Mishnah, Moses praying for Miriam's healing, for example, using an element of a story in the Mishnah, the drawing of the circle. The interplay, and I just think it's interesting. I just think it's fascinating that they do this. And of course, the more you know, the more interesting it becomes, right? If you didn't know the story of Honi the circle maker and you read that midrash from Avoti Rabbanatan of Moses drawing a circle for Miriam, you think, oh, that's nice. That was creative. But if you knew the story of Honi, right, how much more interesting it becomes. Bobby. 
Thank Did you. you say that there's a midrash that Moses drew a circle around himself when he couldn't enter the land? Yes. Well, he was asking for something for himself and Honey yeah. was asking for something for the people's survival. So that's the third example. So we have Honey asking for the people. We have Moses asking for Miriam in Avoti Rabbi Natan, and then Moses asking for himself. Beautiful, beautiful observation, Bobby. Thank you. Judy. At that time, these were all oral traditions, right? Nobody had yeah. a book to read about what Moses did or Honey did. Yeah. So when you tell things orally, there are always changes or misinterpretations. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. So here we go. Going back to the text. So we're in the middle of this slide. So the rain began only in small droplets. And Honey says, I didn't ask for only small droplets. I need rain. We need a lot of rain. To fill the cisterns, ditches, and caves, right? A triplicate of these ideas that we need, right? You see a lot of triplicates in the rabbinic writing. With enough water to last the whole year. And rain began to fall furiously with anger, right? It's raining cats and dogs, but like you can tell that God is a little, God's a little miffed <laughs> that Honey has the chutzpah to, to, well, to paint God in the corner. By drawing the circle around himself in that way. And the rains were, you know, really almost violent. So Honey comes back. I didn't ask for this violent rain, this damaging rain either. But for benevolent rain. <laughs> rain. Pastoral, you know, I don't want Beethoven's fifth symphony. I want the ninth symphony, the pastoral. That's what I want in the rains. Or is it the sixth? Maybe it's the sixth. No, Subsequently, the rains fell in their standard manner, but continued unabated. So there was a normal a normal flow of rain, but a lot of it. You try to make us accept some laws. Right, right. right, a lot of rain. And so what did the Jews have to do? Where do they have to go? The Temple Mount. Why the Temple Mount, Steve? Why did they go up there? It was the highest place. Because it was the highest place. Yeah, and everything else was flooding. So they go up to the Temple Mount because there was so much rain. They said to him, just as you prayed over the rains, that they should fall, so too pray that they should stop. And he says, go and look to that stone, that large stone, to see if it's still there, if it had been washed away. Now, this claim in stone is, is, has a connection to that Ophel from before this place that people in certain circumstances would go either for their lost and found because they were indebted. Um, and a lot of rain would have had to have fallen for that place to have been put into risk. Now, now we have the introduction in the second part of this slide, this back and forth with the rabbinic authority of the time. Shimon ben Shetach who is the Nasi. He's the chief rabbi, the head of the Sanhedrin, who says to Choni, if it wasn't for you, if you were not you, we would have gotten rid of you. <laughs> but what can I do? For whatever reason, you know, if anyone else had stood in a circle and drawn a circle around himself or herself and said to you, God, I'm not going to leave until we pray. We would have seen that person as blasphemous and ostracized them. But you seem to have the ear of God. You nudge, you nag, you mitchate, and God does what you want. Like a father with a beloved son who will do whatever that beloved son asks of him. And so what can I do? And, Choni, er, and, and so Shimon ben Shate is stuck in this really difficult place because he knows that Choni is not a good example for everybody else. You don't want people thinking they can do this. Doesn't make for good civil society that anyone can cause this, but it's effective. And so it was suggested by Rabbi Pekin that there's like a, 
an ambivalence or an inner conflict, not only in, in, in the authors of the Mishnah and the way they craft the story. And that Shimon ben Shetach is like the rabbinic mind or the Greek chorus speaking on behalf of the community, which is, ugh. on the one hand, good job. On the other hand, I wish you hadn't. On the one hand, you, you did what we need. On the other hand, this is going to set a bad example. Right. That's great. And if you're the Nasi, if you're the head of the community and you can't do this, your own power is threatened if this guy can. What do we, what do we need a Nasi for if we have a Honi who can do God's bidding, for, who can do our bidding to God and vice versa? Right, that he's breaking the rabbinic structure. Also, he's acting almost supernaturally. He is without rabbinic authority, causing God to change God's actions, and that is borderline supernatural. That is borderline magic. That is borderline miracle working. That breaks the understanding of the way that the rabbinic mind thinks the world works. In the rabbinic mind, if there isn't enough water, what should you do? The community should pray and fast. Not have a guy go ahead and do this. It is one o'clock. For the benefit of those watching later, I got to bring the conversation to an end. That was um, great. Thank and you. We, we will pick up here next week as Thank the story you. continues into its next Thank iteration, you. that of the Babylonian Talmud, of the Jerusalem Talmud. Wow. Thanks, everybody. And Thank David, you. I have your email address. I'm going to send you my message I sent you last week so you can respond. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.